Next up is Terry Bacon. Now I want to tell you, I have known Terry for 58 years at least, almost 60 years. And she doesn't look a day over 30. But oh, she was very little though, you know, whenever I was, I was, I was much older than her. And our father, our, my mother and father, her mother and father, we went to the same kingdom hall. We all knew the same people. We all loved the same people. We all have affection for those folks who are in the kingdom hall. Uh, you know, it's just, um, it's a wonderful thing to see Terry here because I have prayed that people that I have known in my childhood would come to know Jesus Christ because I love those people. And I'd like to see them all come to a full knowledge of who Jesus is and to know in their hearts that they have eternal life. And, and Terry is an answer to my prayer. She's an answer to my prayers. So we want Terry to come up here and she is going to speak to us on the subject of God has always loved me. And this is her testimony. God has always loved me. I just want you to know the room is always bigger from this side. Um, I just want to say a quick prayer. Um, I want to come to Jesus. I want to thank him for this opportunity that he's given me to tell what he's done in my life. Um, I'm living proof that prayer an prayers are answered. Um, I just want to thank all of you for your time and for listening. I thank you, God, that you are bringing light into darkness. I thank you that you um, are willing to die for us. I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide my words and that I will speak truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this morning when Marty was talking and he talked about the uh, tough mutter, I thought to myself, uh, the road to salvation is kind of like that sometimes. Um, and it's kind of like an obstacle course, and there are uh, bumps and dips, and there's fog on the road, and there's all kinds of things that happen. And I don't know about you, but I found myself often in a place where I would say, Lord, is this really the life that you picked for me? And he would go, no, you chose it. But he would say, but I am the God that brings beauty from ashes, and even if you burn it down, I am the God that restores, rebuilds, and resurrects, and I am teaching you to rejoice. And that being said, um, let's begin, because my story is not different from many people's. I was born into the Jehovah's Witness belief system. Uh, my grandparents on both sides and my parents and most of my extended family were and still are Jehovah's Witnesses. There was no other belief. After all, they said it was the truth. So at a very young age, I wanted to know God. And I wanted to walk, I wanted to talk to God as Abraham and Moses had talked to him. And I can remember uh, being about five years old and during one of the weekly meetings turning to my mom and saying I wanted to talk to God and it was loud enough that everybody could hear us and they all looked at me and my mother like you'll fix her right and um, so my mom you know gently patted me and said to me well God doesn't talk to us anymore and I was devastated truly because I had that was my desire so this is where my testimony begins in the fact that it was at this moment, though I was not aware at the time, that I had chosen to serve God. I had chosen God. Um, there was no prayer at the altar, no asking Jesus to come into my heart. I was not saved. And it was from this moment forward the devil attempted to kill and discredit me. It is here that Romans chapter 8, verse 38, which says nothing can separate us from God's love, began to play out in my life, but it would be five decades before I would know. Uh, my life became a battlefield. Sadly, oftentimes the people, especially grown-ups, that you're supposed to be able to trust as a child are the ones that will do you the most harm. Sometimes it's family, sometimes it's people you see professionally, 
Sometimes it's people your family called friends. These are the people that Satan used to lie to me. These are the people that took advantage of my childhood and stole my innocence. It was at their hands and by their words that I was abused both physically and mentally. I was falsely accused, rejected, and reviled. I lived in fear of God's wrath for my inability to prevent these things from happening. And I often wondered why these things happened over and over. I wondered what had I done to deserve this, and I often wished that I had never been born. I stopped fighting in my teenage years because I learned if I didn't fight, it would end quicker. The summer I turned 15, I got baptized, hoping that things would get better. I pioneered that summer, too, in hopes that my works would appease God's anger towards me for my constant failure. There was a new group of people to fight off that year. My brother's friends, the regular pioneers that would become circuit overseers, boys from school, and one of my former abusers returned from Vietnam and moved into our house. I confused lust for love. Whether willing or unwilling, I was a slave to my flesh. My parents divorced when I was 16. My father was a truck driver and frequently missed the meetings. His anger flared often, and I was afraid of him my whole life. My mom was independent and drank a little too much, and they both remarried almost immediately after their divorce was final. My dad made sure that my mom got disfellowshipped, and not him, even though he confessed to my mother of frequent infidelity and he would become an elder and remain one until his death 40 years later. I moved with my mom and stepfather to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was my senior year of high school. I dabbled in drugs and was rebellious, got into lots of bad situations, and because I'd skipped school the whole time my parents were getting divorced, I was struggling to graduate on time. Once again, I tried to be a good girl and a good witness, and by the time I graduated, I, on time, I want to add, I made it. I was doing pretty good, or so I thought. After graduation, my relationship with the former boyfriend was rekindled. He was now a regular pioneer, and by December, we were married. We were babies. He was 21, and I was 18. Things went pretty well for about two years. We were good witnesses, checking off all the boxes every week, and I thought I'd put Satan behind me, and it would be happy ever after the fairy tale. Neither one of us were prepared for marriage. We were selfish and needy. It was the early 70s, a time when witnesses were more concerned about the length of a man's hair, or the color of his shirt, or the size of his mustache than they were his love for God. Physical above the spiritual. Although he was a ministerial servant, they began to harass him about his hair and forbid him to give public talks because his shirt wasn't white or his mustache was too big. He began to miss meetings and soon he wasn't going at all. And for four more years, we struggled to maintain the best we knew how. I still went to all the meetings. We had a baby girl and he began to hang with the guys from work. He partied, he fought, we fought, and my past got in the way. I didn't want to fail at marriage like my parents and so my solution was suicide, which as you can see, I'm not very good at. Um, so shortly after that, we were divorced. This was the first of my divorces, and just FYI, he got saved long before me, married again, and has taught Sunday school for many years. For the next almost 35 years, I would struggle to know God as a Jehovah's Witness. I was ruled by fear like a savage taskmaster, afraid to leave because I would lose my family or die at Armageddon, afraid to live, afraid to die, I married a witness, a non-witness, a fake witness, a broken witness, and the last time I made sure he had never even considered being a witness. The devil was clearly doing his happy dance. I had been on probation, privately or publicly reproved many times. I had so many committee meetings over my hair, my clothes, what they thought I did, that they could hardly carry around my file. I was disfellowshipped six months after my first divorce because I had dropped my daughter off to visit her father and stayed too long. Nine months later, I had a baby boy. Two years later, in my second marriage, I would have my third and final child, a daughter. 
I would seek approval in men, in drugs, in the world, and sometimes in the Kingdom Hall. In July of 2002, I left the Kingdom Hall. It was the hardest and scariest thing I have ever done. I left angry because I had given my all for the last several years. I gave talks. I spent time going to door, door to door. I pioneered occasionally. I fed the circuit overseer. I was seeking God the best I knew how, and I was getting divorced again. My husband had cheated for the third time. I felt lost. I needed something to hang on to, but I was told I could not pioneer again because I wasn't a good example. And I thought to myself, this is it. This is all I've got to give. If this isn't enough, if this is who God is, then I want nothing to do with him and I'm gone. I thought the first 50 years were yours, the second 50 are mine. And I was going to live like I had never lived before. My kids were grown and I was on my own. Don't talk to me about God because he has nothing for me and I have nothing for him. And I stepped into the world on purpose. In September of 2002, I met my present husband. By February of 2003, we were living together. I became a pot-smoking, motorcycle-riding, godless woman. We married in September, and one of the things that he liked about me the most was I didn't go to church. What he didn't know was that the great hole in my heart was growing, not shrinking. He moved me to Idaho in 2004, far away from my family or anyone I knew. I had married my father. His short fused temper and booming voice often crushed my soul. It was about controlling my thoughts, my words, my life. He would use my own brokenness against me. The mental and emotional abuse left me exhausted and alone and terrified. I don't know if I was more afraid of him or my own thoughts of doubt, self-loathing, and worthlessness. I did whatever I could to numb the pain on the inside while I did my best to appease him on the outside. There was no consistency. What didn't make him angry yesterday infuriated him today. The anxiety, the anxiety I felt was beyond words, and I was trapped. My stepdad was diagnosed with cancer in the spring of 2005, and we moved back to Missouri in June. And in July, my husband and I had a motorcycle wreck. It was a bad one. But it was here that God began to work. As I regained consciousness, I heard that voice. And it said, no one can save you but you. I had no idea what that meant. And it would be four more years before I would begin to figure it out. My husband was airlifted with fourth degree burns on his leg that required skin grafts and two weeks in the hospital. And it would take me six months to find a doctor, a chiropractor, that would even address my neck injury. He would tell me a, a year later that my injury should have killed me or at least left me paralyzed from the chin down. Before spring of 2006, my stepdad passed away and six weeks later I opened a wig store. My husband's Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality continued to change at the drop of a hat. Work was my sanctuary, so I worked six days a week, 10 hours a day. The hole in my heart had grown so large, I would drive to work, pounding on the steering wheel, screaming, God, I want to know the truth. Not man's truth, but your truth. The enemy knew me better than I knew myself. I was certain the truth was nothing like what I'd known. I searched everywhere but in God's own word, and for a while, I thought I'd found the truth in New Age. Reading anything that had not been published or approved by the witnesses felt like cheating. I was sure that if I read anything not approved by them, I was gonna be carried away by the demons. I would be in trouble if anyone knew what I was reading. I was searching in all the wrong places, and I was so afraid. I didn't wanna get caught in false religion, even though I already was, and I didn't wanna die at Armageddon, but to seek God in a church was out of the question. By 2009, I had been involved in New Age for about three years. It wasn't working. 
I had also been in the wig business about three years, and I got a new advertising sales rep for my business. I'm sure I wasn't going to like her, but we became very good friends. I did not buy much advertising, but we talked, and she would talk to me about Jesus, and I would spew new age on her. Every week before she left, she would pull up on my computer the sermon from her church the week before. And she would say very kindly, if you get a chance, check this out. And I would say, okay. And she would leave and immediately hit delete. This went on for about a year. And at the same time, she was talking to me. She would say, I wish I had a better job. I hate this job. So every week, I would delete it. She'd come back. Then one day, she came back and she said, instead of talking about her, her previous week, she said, oh, by the way, we're gonna do a, a series uh, on Hertz habits and hangups, healing them, healing your Hertz habits and hangups. I was so excited, but afraid at the same time. I just want you to know that she got a new job right after that. So um, I thought I'd go to that series and I was afraid to go, but Rachel was gonna go. That's my oldest daughter, and I thought, well, she's gonna go, she'll save me. She won't let me get duped. She won't let me get taken into false religion. It'll be okay. So I went, and she was already saved. Um, so I kind of thought she would help me out. I didn't want to get involved in a cult. I don't know if I've ever met anybody that wanted to know God and be loved by him that ran from him as hard as I did. So much so that at one point, someone suggested I should read the book of John. But my fear, my stubborn independence, and for what other reason, I balked at that. I did, however, go to the Christian bookstore and buy a book called Promises, written by a woman from Bonterre named Betty. You probably know her. And I'm real bad about not reading from the front to the back. I flip through the book. I always like to see what it's about. And I know this is ridiculous, but a page caught my eye, and in the middle of that page, it said, if you have not yet read the book of John, put this book down and go read the book of John. And I thought to myself, well, all righty then. I guess you can't really say it much plainer than that, can you? So it was October the 26th, 2009, when I sat down at my dining room table with the Message Bible to read the book of John, everyone came. Satan was there to remind me of my childhood beliefs and fears. The Holy Spirit was there to explain for the first time what I was reading. The Father was there with open arms, waiting for me to see him. And Jesus was there doing what he is always doing. He was undoing the works of the devil. So as Satan was telling me I shouldn't be reading that Bible, I couldn't believe it. It was written by false prophets, all lies. Jesus was reasoning with me kindly, asking me, do you really believe that the devil would bring you to me? Would he tell you that you could be saved by believing in me? Do you really believe that you, what you heard as a child, or do you believe I can forgive you and your sins and you can be saved? I wanted to believe. I wanted to be forgiven. I wanted to be saved. I wanted to be born again like Jesus had told Nicodemus. And I remembered when I was a little girl, I wanted to know God, to talk to God, to be friends with God. Was it really true? Was it possible to be friends with God? And God said, yes. In fact, he told me he had been waiting for me since that time in the kingdom hall when I said I wanted to talk to God. He said, I had called, he said he had called to me often, the voice after the motorcycle wreck, but I had not recognized his voice. I was 56 years old. It had been 50 years since I had said I wanted to talk to God. I would love to be able to tell you that the moment I was saved, my life turned around, but it didn't. The transformation from works to grace was truly like being born again. The depth of our faith is based on our ability to trust 
And while Romans 12, 3 says, as God has dealt each one a measure of faith, my, mother, my measure of faith was all but depleted. I didn't trust anyone. I spent countless hours clearing out the old truth, making a place for the new truth. It's been almost 11 years since I started getting saved. It's been a work in progress, and according to Romans 8, 29 through 30, it's a work that will continue until I'm made into the full image of Christ, which will be either at my death or the return of Christ, whichever comes first. I can tell you this for sure. Jesus was there through it all. How do I know, you ask? I know because once I confessed my sin, something only I could do, like the voice said after the motorcycle wreck, and received his forgiveness, I was able to recognize Jesus. I could look back and see all the places where Jesus stood, all the times he had sent me people, put food on my porch, opened doors, provided clothing and shelter, offered me freedom, given me opportunity. I could see where he had literally saved my life and saved me from things that could have been so much worse. I could have been sold into sex trafficking. I could have become an addict, a prostitute. I could have lost my children or my life. There isn't time for me to tell you all the things that God has done for me, all that he has saved me from. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus has freed me from drugs, from promiscuity, from works, from selfishness, and from self-sufficiency. He has saved me from cancer, motorcycle wrecks, car wrecks, false religion, confusion, and from the lies of the devil. He has improved my husband, my marriage, my finances, and my life. He has saved both of my daughters and is working on my son. And before I came, yesterday I talked to my son, who surprised me and said to me, he has two boys. My, my son doesn't go to church, but he has two boys. They're 15 and almost 14. And he dropped this and then drove away. He said, my two boys want to get baptized. I was like, what? And he said, but I don't know what I'm going to do about it. I was like, OK, I can fix that. <laughs> so God is still working, but I believe that um, I, well, three of my grandchildren are already baptized, and three more are waiting to be baptized. So he has proven to me that he is trustworthy. Um, I can put my complete faith in, I can put my complete faith in Jesus, and whatever he says he will do, he, it is good as done. Um, he has truly made me a new creation. He changed me from fleshly life to spiritual life, and he has grown my character. Jesus is with you always, and God loves you always. Until we hear and believe the real truth, we are blind to the things that God is doing or has done for us. The truth is so not what we heard prior to being saved, covered by the blood of Jesus, sanctified, justified, counted as righteous, born again, and adopted into God's family. In closing, the truth is, no matter where you may find yourself today, no matter what you think you have done or failed to do, God is offering you a free gift, eternal life. John 3.16 tells us all is required as we believe in his son Jesus, who he was, and what he did. If you are not yet saved, today is a good day to be saved. Saved from separation from God, from the consequences of sin, even the desire to sin. You need only to confess you have sin, ask to be forgiven, ask Jesus to come in and receive and believe the free gift of salvation. If you are already saved, you are a work in progress. Do not give up. Keep seeking him, keep thirsting for him, keep asking even when it seems impossible. Be thankful always for what he has done and is doing. What he has done for one, he will do for another. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 reminds us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways consider him and he will make your path straight. God is not done writing my story or yours and God has always loved me and he has always loved you. Thanks.